All right. Um, so uh, today we are going to continue our discussion of the innate immune system and chapter four. Um, just so you know, um, tomorrow's lab handout is already posted. Um, so you can go ahead and take a look at that for tomorrow. Um, also remember that you have answers to the questions from last week that are due tomorrow. So just be aware of those. Um, also, if you uh, printed or downloaded the slides super early, I did make a change in between my last class and this one. I realized I had messed up one of the slides, so there's like one slide different if you downloaded it um, super early. Um, so last time we talked through the process of inflammation as is shown on this slide, where we have um, some type of tissue damage that allows in um, bacteria, we have our local macrophages producing inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. Those act on the vasculature to allow in um, fluid and other cells, and eventually our neutrophils um, can start to phagocytose those bacteria to clear them. And this is sort of that very standard type of inflammatory response. One of the things that we did not talk about last time is that there is a similar response, sort of classic response, to certain types of viral infections. One of the reasons why this is of interest has to do with us thinking about a couple things about how virus biology works, how the virus infection cycle works, sort of some general virology. So, when we think about viral replication, there are a number of stages of steps um, that a virus has to go through in order to replicate. The first of those steps is that the virus needs to interact with a receptor, which you can see on the top of both of these figures, um, in order to attach to that receptor and enter the cell. The ability of that virus to enter the cell is the first big sort of issue in viral replication. One thing that becomes a little bit tricky here is that viruses have this big problem of how they get into cells. Phagocytosis could almost be a way to help a virus into a cell. <laughs> Phagocytosis could actually be helpful for the virus, and in some cases, viruses almost get into cells by triggering processes that look sort of like phagocytosis. So that's one reason why that traditional neutrophil phagocytosis thing might not be the awesomest idea for viruses. The other big thing, of course, is that most parts of the virus infectious cycle are taking place inside of one of our cells. So these are not usually extracellular for much of their life cycle. So we need to be able to get rid of that virus that's an intracellular pathogen. Um, one other thing to be aware of when we think about viral replication is that viruses are quite simple and many, if not all, many of their steps in replication require using host enzymes. So viruses tend to have relatively few proteins and they use host proteins to do many steps of their replication. So for example, you have 20,000 genes, and then we can talk about how many proteins you have. It's much larger than that, but what big number. HIV has nine proteins. So viruses have these really small numbers of proteins, and they are largely using host proteins. That also causes a problem for sort of two other pieces of this. One of them is that it can be difficult to think about what could be a PAMP for a virus. What might be a novel pattern for a virus? That we don't have LPS that is in huge groups of viruses. Viruses are largely using host enzymes, which are not really good PAMPs because they're not different because they're ours. They're not pathogen or microbe associated molecular patterns. And if you wanted to take this cell that's infected with HIV here or a general virus. I think it's supposed to be polio on the left. General virus is fine. If you wanted to actually take that cell and cure it of the pathogen, you can imagine with our neutrophil, 
that it could do phagocytosis of a bacteria. It could kill that bacterium in its phagosome using the compounds and the antimicrobial peptides that we talked about last time. And, we could, and then it's sort of it doesn't have any bacteria anymore. It's cured. Yes, I'm doing little air quotes. For these viruses, largely what happens is the virus has, so, delivers its nucleic acid. And then we just see sort of replication and other molecular biological processes happening with that nucleic acid to make more viral proteins. So if you wanted to try to cure this cell of virus, you would almost have to come in and like pick through the RNAs and be like, this is a good RNA, this is a bad RNA, this is a good RNA. You'd have to almost sort it at the level of the nucleic acid. Does that sound like something you could do? I see lots of head shakes. What do you think? You think we're going to cure these cells of their viral infection? What do you think, Malik? I see, the head, I see, see lots of expressions. I don't think so. Malik doesn't think so, and I don't think so either. Um, we're probably not going to be able to like, pick out the bad RNAs and get them out of the cell. And so the way that we deal with a virally infected cell is going to end up being really different than the way we might deal with other cells. And so the innate immune response that needs to happen is also going to be very different. In our uh, inflammation process we talked about last time, we saw those cytokines, IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, IL-6. Um, there are also cytokines that are important for the viral response. These cytokines are known as interferons. Um, interferons were first discovered by two scientists named Isaacs and Lindemann in 1957. And they were actually trying to do some interesting virology experiments um, with influenza virus. So they were um, infecting chicken cells with influenza virus. And what they found is that in the media of their infected cells, there was a mystery substance. So they would infect cells, and then they would find this weird substance in the media that could interfere with further infections. It, if you tried to transfer virus, you could get an infection. But if you transferred virus and the media with the mystery substance in it, it interfered. That's all they knew about it at the time, so they called it interferon, because <laughs> it was a mystery substance that interfered. We now know a lot more about interferons. Um, they are types of cytokines. There are actually three types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Um, type 1 is the type that we're going to talk a lot about in the innate immune system. And so everything else, whenever I talk about interferons today, I mean type 1. Um, officially, type 1s, the main ones are either type interferon alpha or interferon beta, though there are a couple other type ones. Um, there's another type called interferon gamma that's a type 2 interferon. It does have some roles with innate immunity, but it's largely something that we think about with adaptive immunity. And so we'll hear about interferon uh, gamma when we talk about adaptive immunity later. There is also a type of interferon called the type 3 interferon, um, interferon lambda. It's mostly made by epithelial cells. It's been uh, described much more recently. It probably is also pretty important in innate immunity, um, but it's not going to be a big focus right now. But you may see it in papers and things like that. Um, so um, our type 1 interferons, alpha and beta, are the first ones to appear after infection. Um, and they're made very rapidly. We're talking a small number of hours after infection. Um, in fact, they are usually going down by 10 hours after infection, if that infection is not sort of really replicating out a long time and further pushing interferon production. So interferons are really um, made quickly and briefly. What you will notice is that our type 1 interferons, interferon alpha and beta, are made by basically all cells, most if not all cells, as this table says. Well, interferon gamma is made by other cell types, mostly T cells of the adaptive immune system. That's why we're going to deal with interferon gamma later. Um, so this is a parallel with what we saw last time. We've got important cytokines that are having a response to our pathogen, just a different group of cytokines, the type 1 interferons. And these type 1 interferons 
also have a different physiologic effect than do the cytokines we talked about last time. So IL-1 beta, IL-6, TNF-alpha, we talked about certain effects. Type 1 interferons have a different set of effects. Um, and the broad term for this effect is called the antiviral state. I show this version of the figure for a very important reason. There's one thing that I think is really important about this version of the antiviral state figure. What you see is that we have a cell here who is infected. The cell gets infected with one viral particle. It makes many viral particles that could go out and infect other cells. And this infected cell also makes our cytokine the type 1 interferon. That type 1 interferon acts on a neighboring cell. So this is the virus infected cell. You can see it's got the virus in it. The type 1 interferon is acting on a neighboring cell um, that has an interferon receptor. Um, and the antiviral state is occurring in that neighboring uninfected cell. It is becoming basically sort of uninfectable, or it is getting blocked to infection. Because we can't necessarily cure this infection, instead, this cell is probably a goner once it's infected. We want to protect the neighbors um, so that they don't also become infected and become virus production factories. And so I think that one thing that students often get really confused about is that the antiviral state is happening classically in a separate cell than the original infected cell. And so the idea here is that we are going to see a block of viral replication in that nearby uh, uninfected cell. Um, this is another image of that. Um, what you can see is I made a line in the middle of the cell to try to tell you that there's two cells here, because <laughs> I wanted them to be two separate cells. Um, so um, our cell who is infected, which you can see on the left, will make type 1 interferon. That type 1 interferon will bind to an interferon receptor on an adjacent cell. Um, it's actually, in the case of type 1 interferons, they all bind to the same receptor, the interferon alpha beta receptor, sometimes known as IFNR. IFN, alpha beta is just A, and then R for receptor, so IFNR. So they bind to IFNR, and they lead to a signal transduction cascade. In the end, we see production of a bunch of new transcripts that eventually lead to proteins. In general, these proteins have a name as a group. And that name that they have as a group is that they are ISGs or interferon stimulated genes. So if you stimulate a cell with interferon, the result is you make interferon stimulated genes. There are thousands of interferon stimulated genes. We know how some of them work, but we don't know how all of them work. Um, and what seems to be important is the precise combination of which interferon stimulated genes are made in different situations. So perhaps Ebola makes number 7, number 23, and number 502, and that gives you a good response. And flu makes number 2, number 93, and number 697. Like, it's probably the combination is important. There's a lot of that that people are still trying to work out with things like transcriptomics. Um, one other thing that we know about our interferon-stimulated genes is that they, like all genes, are controlled by promoters. So there's a part in front of the gene. Here's our ISG. It's a part in front of the gene that is bound by some transcription factor in order to turn on transcription. Um, we're going to see lots of transcription factors as we go through some of these pathways today. But one thing that we know is that this, tr this promoter is also pretty well characterized. Most of our interferon stimulated genes have a promoter called the ISRE or the interferon stimulated response element. So um, interferon 
usually leads to um, turning on transcription of the interferon stimulated response element, stimulated by interferon. And that re results in the production of an interferon stimulated gene, or ISG. Um, these ISGs are now going to block viral replication um, in, our in our neighboring uninfected cells. So these are some of possible ways that that can happen. So now we're looking at the uninfected cell, that neighboring cell that's going to block viral replication. One protein that can be made, that this is an ISG, is called protein kinase R, PKR. PKR is able to bind to um, double-strand RNA. It interacts with a protein that's involved in translation, and it inhibits translation. Why would inhibiting translation be important for giving us the antiviral state? Why might this be useful for this antiviral state? Yeah, Molly. Yes, except for one thing, translate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you can't translate anything, that includes you can't translate the virus proteins. So you can't allow, so virus replication can't happen in this cell because we can't make virus proteins anymore. So the cell is like, haha, no more proteins, no, no replication for you. We see the production of something called 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase, also known as OAS it eventually leads to mRNA degradation. Why would mRNA degradation be important here for inducing an antiviral state? What was that that you said before, Molly? <laughs> now we don't have any transcripts. <laughs> um, and so again, we're gonna block the virus from having mRNAs, so it can't replicate, we're not gonna have any transcripts. We can turn on some proteins that are known as the MX proteins, they actually block assembly of viral proteins and proteins called the IFIT proteins, um, which are able to also inhibit translation. So there, this is a small sampling of things that some interferon stimulated genes will do. There's one that I learned about this summer um, that actually basically puts ubiquitins on viral proteins and gets them degraded. It's actually super cool. Um, there's another one that I think is really interesting called SAMHD1 that gets turned on. It basically breaks down DNTPs. So there are no DNTPs around to be made into new DNA and RNA. So basically what happens is we make SAMHD1 and SAMHD1 just breaks all the DNTPs. So then we can't make um, additional DNA. So again, the virus is sort of stopped in its tracks because we're not going to be able to produce um, new nucleic acids, particularly new uh, DNA here. So if you look at this, this seems like a pretty nice system to completely block viral replication in that uninfected cell, to really stop that virus in its tracks. However, there's a big problem with this. So let's think about all of these products. First, we'll look at the SAMHD1 product. Are, is the use of DNTPs specific to viruses? What do you think, Jordan? No. Where else are they used? Yeah. The host. The cell uses them. The cell needs to replicate its DNA. So the cell is not only kind of getting in the way of the virus, it's sort of getting in its own way, too, here. If we look back at the previous slide, we're inhibiting translation. We're inhibiting, we're degrading mRNAs. These are all important aspects of the host. And note that this doesn't say inhibit viral RNA, but totally leave the host ones okay. okay. Or inhibit viral translation, but totally leave host proteins okay. No, this is a broad block of transcription. This is a broad mRNA degradation. So this is not particularly healthy for this cell. If it's happening for a short period of time, this can be okay. But if you had this happening to your cells over long periods of time, this would be really deleterious. 
if you had a lot of interferon in your body, how do you think you would feel? Anybody? How do you feel if you have lots of interferon? Your cells are going to do stop doing translation. You're going to degrade your mRNAs. You're not going to have DNTPs. How do you feel? How do you feel, Jordan? Bad. You're not going to feel so great, right, if you have large amounts of interferon because your cells are not going to be doing particularly well. So if we think about this defense system. If we think about first the phagocytosis defense system we talked about last time. It turns out that only about four cell types in your body can do phagocytosis. So most of those things that we talked about last time are, can be done by four kinds of cells because they're the only ones who need to worry about it. How many kinds of cells in your body can get infected by a virus? Yes, Marina? All of them. So how many of them probably would like to know if their neighbor is infected? All of them. In fact, almost every cell of your body has an interferon receptor. And so almost every cell of your body is going to be able to respond to interferon. So interferon is inducing a lot of gene products that can be problematic for cells. Most of your cells have receptors. So if you start making interferon, you are going to have a number of cells that are not so happy. And again, for a short period of time, that's good because it's going to block viral replication. And again, if we think in evolutionary scales, Having you feel sick for a day is nothing compared to you being able to knock down that virus and not have it replicate and kill you. And so if you actually have large quantities of interferon, you are actually end up having some pretty specific physiological consequences, specifically um, fear, fever, not fear. I guess you could have fear too, but <laughs> fever, um, chills, nausea, and a symptom called malaise which is that general crappy feeling you have, <laughs> that bleh, when you feel sick. <laughs> that has a technical term, it's malaise. Um, if you have large quantities of interferon in your body, that's what you feel like. Does that sound like anything to you, that combination of symptoms? Yes, Molly? That's what people describe as flu-like symptoms. And so every virus infection generally is gonna hit some PRR and lead to interferon. And basically, that's why most, so many things lead to flu-like symptoms. Most immunologists don't call flu-like symptoms flu-like symptoms. We call it acute viral infection, because that's just what happens when you get a virus that's leading to interferon production. Um, so interferon has some great pros in blocking infection. Also has some cons. Can be a little bit harsh on cells. One thing that I also have over here on the uh, right-hand side is the fact that we are also learning about how different types of cytokines can interact with one another. There's a lot of data showing that the type 1 interferons can do things like inhibit IL-1, TNF, some of the proteins we learned about last time. And so in fact, um, interferon may be somewhat um, immunocompromising or it might weaken your immune system to other types of pathogens. Really, that's a good thing because you don't want your immune system to go totally haywire and give you an inflammatory disease or give you some kind of real problem. You want your immune system kept in check. But in fact, if you think about many influenza patients, for example, who get hospitalized, many of them actually don't end up being hospitalized because of their flu infection. They get a second bacterial infection when they're getting over the flu. And it may be because those interferons are actually knocking down other parts of the immune system. Um, so interferons do have a number of problematic effects. So this is one of the two things I wanted to talk through today was this idea of the antiviral state. The other thing that we need to talk about are the specifics of PRRs. So last time we just sort of had a general PRR and it led to, it bound to some kind of PAMP or MAMP or DAMP and it led to magic signaling, and we made a cytokine. Now what we actually want to do, now that you know why that's important, either in a viral or bacterial sense, now that you sort of care, I want to talk through some more of the specific details of some of those PRRs. Your textbook has this lovely table 
that covers many of the big groups of PRRs, though there are some that are not contained within these groups. And for the rest of the time today, I'm going to sort of talk through these groups and the specific details of them. So you, you in fact, are going to see this as I go through different groups. This is a nice uh, guide post <laughs> to the things we're going to be talking about. Um, notice that these have differences in terms of their cellular location. So different groups of them are defending different parts of the cell. Um, they are binding to different types of ligands, so they're defending against different types of pathogens, um, and they're leading to slightly different processes. So as we talk through the different groups, those are going to be big things that we're going to think about. So the very, so this is actually not the first actual PRR. There were a few PRRs that were out there before this, but this one is really the one that started this whole idea of understanding PRR biology. The word PRR wasn't a thing until this. Um, and I think this is like the most fascinating thing ever. Somebody actually wrote a paper in 1989 basically saying, hey, immunologists, this is kind of what we haven't figured out yet. This is what we're missing. I propose there's this whole black box that we haven't figured out yet and proposed it. And then his lab discovered it uh, seven years later, um, but didn't win the Nobel Prize. And that's the thing we can talk about. Somebody else won instead. That's an issue for another day. Um, so these were based on a gene that was first described in Drosophila. Um, the first person who described these genes was a person named Christiane Nielsen Volhart. Um, she won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of this gene, I think in 96, I think. Um, and she was not studying anything to do with the immune system. She was actually studying developmental biology. She wanted to figure out how development worked. And she was looking at something called dorsoventral patterning. So how do you get a difference between a front and a back and a head and a tail when you see development happening? And so she was looking at mutations of different genes and trying to see what was going on. And at one point, she made some mutations in just random genes. And she looked at her flies under the microscope. And she saw something. She mutated this gene, and it turns out that her flies had completely distorted dorsoventral patterning. So they did not actually have differences in head versus tail. Now, this woman's name, as I mentioned, is Christiane Nolsein Volhart. She is German. Does anybody here know any German? Yes. All right, here you go. Ready? <laughs> have you ever heard the word tall in German? Does anyone know the word tall in German? No? Cal? Huh? So great, OK. So I've, I hear different definitions for it. It's usually an, ex, an exclamation that you make that's great, or wow, or cool, or I've even heard, oh shit. <laughs> like, that's, that's what it is. So she looks at her microscope. She sees the flies that have totally messed up dorsal ventral patterning. And she says, tall. <laughs> and so the gene gets named tall. <laughs> Um, later on, people found similar genes in humans. They were referred to as the toll-like receptors because they have structural similarity to that original gene toll. Um, later on, this is about 97, I think, um, somebody was able to look at actually adult flies that were missing this gene. And what they found is that those flies all died. And they died of massive fungal infection. These are fungal hyphae coming off this fly. This actually was on the cover of the journal. It was a very famous picture in immunology. And so people then also realized that this same toll had a role outside of development. It, in fact, seemed to have this immune function to help protect against microbes. So the first big group of, toll of pattern recognition receptors that were described were the TLRs, or the toll-like receptors, based on this fly with the fungal infection. Um, Toll-like receptors have a pretty specific structure. They have some um, domain with something called leucine-rich repeats. That allows them to bind to their ligand. And they have some domain that allows for signaling. Here it's referred to as the tier domain. Um, the leucine-rich repeat, you were going to see in a couple other receptors, so I wanted to mention it here. Um, the leucine-rich repeat was actually really hard to work with biochemically for a long time. And so a lot of the details of 
some of the interesting biochemistry of PRRs took a lot longer than you would think, and it was because leucine rich repeats made it so hard to make to purify the proteins. Um, we now know of 13 different TLRs. They vary in things like their ligand and thus the microbes against which they defend. But the variation that we're really going to care about today is that they also vary based on their cellular location. So we're going to divide our TLRs into two groups. One group is on the plasma membrane. And you can see them here at the top. So we've got a group of cell surface TLRs. The other group is found in the endosome or in the lysosome. And these two groups of TLRs act differently. If you look at this figure, um, it labels the ligand for each of these TLRs on the figure. If you were to compare between the two groups very broadly, what would you see as being the big difference between those two groups? Yeah, Jordan. Yeah, most of the ones outside are looking at bacteria or other things. Most of the ones inside are looking at viruses, and particularly most of the ones inside are looking at nucleic acid. And so what you might guess, spoiler alert, this is going to be true, is that these ones that are responding to bacteria are probably going to induce that IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, IL-6 response we talked about last time. And these ones that are inside the cell are probably going to induce interferons, like we talked about this time, because interferons are good for viruses. And inflammatory cytokines are good for bacteria. And so that's actually going to be the big difference we're going to see in their signaling, is that they are going to lead to those two different responses. Um, so this is the a view of what we see from our cell surface uh, TLRs. There's a lot of detail on some of these signaling slides. I am going to hit a couple of specific pieces of that signaling that I want you to know. Don't stress about every last part of this right now. The key thing to notice here is that we're starting with the cell surface TLR. That cell surface TLR is signaling through a specific kind of transcription factor. So we can see a lengthy signal transduction pathway. Yeah, it starts with mighty 88, blah, 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 blah. But the key thing I want you to notice is that it ends up with a transcription factor called NF kappa B, which is also in the title of this slide. For reasons why I have never understood, but I have noticed in all the years I have taught, students always want to call it NF kappa beta, but the, it's a B, it's not a beta. I know, I, don't, I, I got no answer. Um, so all of these cell surface toll-like receptors are going to end up signaling through this transcription factor, NF kappa B. Transcription factors tend to be active when they are in the nucleus. In fact, NF in NF kappa B stands for nuclear factor. Nuclear, uh, NF kappa B is usually um, held in the cytoplasm by an inhibitor, I kappa B, the inhibitor of kappa B. <laughs> if that inhibitor gets degraded, then in fact, NF kappa B goes into the nucleus and starts um, transcription. The key thing I want you to know here is NF kappa B, though I'm going to tell you one other part of the signaling cascade just because it's interesting. So for a long time, people were trying to figure out how IKK received a signal to be degraded. We now know that it receives a phosphate. So then people wanted to find the kinase. And so they were searching for the kinase for a long time. And it was a difficult thing because we now know it's actually three proteins working together. So first they found I kappa, uh, IKK, the, IKK, the inhibitor of kappa B kinase, IKK alpha. And then they found the inhibitor of kappa B uh, kinase, IKK beta. But that still didn't explain everything, and they could not figure it out. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked, and they looked for a really long time. And finally, they found Nemo. And yes, that's why they named it that, um, which was the, it's also known as IKK Gamma. Um, but um, there is this 
nice structure of a whole bunch of different kinases that come together to phosphorylate I kappa B and allow NF kappa B into the nucleus. Why do we care about NF kappa B? Well, it turns out that NF kappa B has a specific set of target genes that it turns on. Just so you know, NF kappa B is a huge transcription factor in immunology. It turns on a lot of things. But in this case, we care about the fact that it turns on things like TNF, IL-1, IL-6, the exact cytokines that are important for that antibacterial response. It turns on some of the chemokines we talked about last time. It also is going to turn on some molecules involved in bringing white blood cells to a site and helping the adaptive immune system. And so if you turn on this NF kappa B transcription factor, you're going to get that inflammatory response we talked about last time. You're going to stimulate adaptive immunity. And that's exactly what you want from a cell surface TLR that's binding to bacteria. You're going to get a response that works against bacteria. Hooray. Alternatively, our TLRs that are in the endosome are binding to nucleic acid. Generally, it is a viral nucleic acid. And so here, the most appropriate response would be the antiviral state response with the production of interferon. Happily, that endosomal TLR can signal through a different signaling pathway. Yes, it shows NF kappa B here. I'm not going to focus on it here. The one that I'm going to focus on is that it also goes through this pathway that turns on some proteins called IRFs. An IRF IRFs are interferon regulatory factors. They're the things that control whether you make interferon. So these endosomal TLRs lead to activation of IRFs. And if you had to guess from the name IRF and what IRF stands for, what do you think IRF might turn on? Interferon. It, in fact, regulates interferon. It is the factor that regulates interferon, the interferon regulatory factor. Um, and so these TLRs lead to IRFs, which will turn on our type 1 interferons and give us the antiviral state. And that's appropriate because our infection was with a virus. Um, we're detecting a viral type of uh, PAMP. These are not the only PRRs that exist. Your textbook talks a little bit about other classes of them. One other class that's mentioned briefly, I am going to mention it super briefly, because part of the issue here is that some of the other ones are actually my research focus, so I love to talk about those. Um, so there is one type known as the CLR. Um, it's the C-type lectin receptor. C-type lectins. Do you remember the word lectin? We talked about lect the word lectin last week. What's the word lectin mean? It means the same thing it did last week. Yeah. So, M so, so what MBL binds to. MBL. MBL stands for mannose binding lectin. So broadly, what do, you, what do you think a lectin is? It binds to carbs. So lectins are proteins that bind to carbohydrates. Mannose binding lectin binds to the carbohydrate mannose. <laughs> um, so C-type lectin receptors bind to C-type lectins, <laughs> shockingly. Um, C-type lectins are actually really important parts of fungal cell walls. And so these are pattern recognition receptors that are great at recognizing fungi particularly extracellular fungi, because those CLRs are on the cell surface. Um, they lead to a pretty complicated uh, combination of specific uh, transcription factors and a cytokine response that ends up being relevant for fungal infection, which I'm not going to get into here. Another big group of uh, PRRs 
are known as the RLRs. Now notice, TLR was toll-like receptor. So basically, you figured out the first one, toll, and then you said the rest of them were all like it. CLR is a C-type lectin-like receptor. So RLR, you want to know who R is, <laughs> that everything else is like. Um, one thing that you should notice as we get into these final groups is that now RLRs and everything else we're going to talk about is a cytoplasmic sensor. So now we're looking for pathogens in the cytoplasm before we were looking at pathogens in the plasma membrane or in some types of membranes. The thing that is found most frequently in cytoplasm is a virus. Your virus is going to be in your cells to use your enzymes to replicate. And so most of these cytoplasmic receptors are frequently looking for viruses. Um, the R in RLRs is Rig I. Um, these proteins were described um, as being similar to an original protein known as Rig I. You can see Rig I working here. Um, Rig I, and in fact, a lot of innate immune receptors seem to actually interact with the mitochondria. It's almost like they use the mitochondria as like a platform or a gathering place. Like, you know, you know how like we have a thing where you're supposed to go if there's an emergency, your emergency exit site. It's almost like the innate immune system's emergency exit site is the mitochondria. They all hang out with the mitochondria. Um, so Rig I is no exception. It's working near the mitochondria. It's binding to nucleic acid in the Specifics of Rig I, it's RNA, though um, there are some RLRs that combine to a few different things. And if we're, so Rig I is in the cytoplasm. It's binding to nucleic acid, particularly RNA from a virus. What would you hope it would produce or it would lead to? What do you think, Jordan? Interferon, Interferon why? Yeah, we want an, we we we're detecting a viral molecule in a place where viruses replicate. We probably want to make a virus response. Happily, we turn on IRFs in this situation. We make interferon. So our next group of PRRs are called the NLRs. So remember, TLR was toll-like receptor. CLR was C-type lectin-like receptor. RLR was Rig I-like receptor. So NLR, right? That's our, our next thing. Um, NLR stands for nucleotide binding domain leucine rich repeat proteins. That doesn't go with the, the like receptor business at all. In fact, originally, they were called the NOD-like receptors. And then we realized that NOD was like a super weird one. And the rest of them weren't like it at all. And so ba people basically backfit a name so that they could keep NLR, <laughs> but make <laughs> the name work. And so you can see that like the N is for nucleotide binding, the L is for leucine rich repeat. Like, it's wacky. Um, but it also tells you something about the structure of these proteins. These proteins have a nucleotide binding domain. These pro proteins have leucine rich repeats, just like the TLRs did, that same pain biochemical uh, domain is found in the NLRs. And then they have some other type of domain. And that domain is usually important for their protein-protein recognition. There are lots of types of NLRs. Some of them have names like NLR P14. NLR P14 means it's NLR. It's got the P kind of um, protein domain here, and it's the 14th one. Or NLR C3 has the C kind. <laughs> and is the third one. Or NLRX1 has the X kind and is the first one, is how they're all named. <laughs> um, this is actually, these are actually a really interesting group of proteins. The top two proteins on this slide are not NLRs. But if you look at them, they have some structural similarities. Um, they have nucleotide binding domains, and the one that's on top even has leucine rich repeats as well. It just has a different protein interaction domain. That protein that's shown on the top is an NBS LRR protein, which is actually the main protein involved in the plant immune response. So we've con uh, convergent evolution has kind of made this same structure important for plant immunity and for vertebrate immunity, and for invertebrate immunity like flies do. The one in the middle is a protein known as APAF1. APAF has a nucleotide binding domain, 
It even has the card domain, which some NLRs have. And it has a WD-40 domain that looks sort of like an LOR. It turns out that you have actually learned about APAF1 before. You have heard of APAF1 in a previous biology class. I am going to come back to APAF1 in just a minute. Because NL different NLRs have some different functions. So some of them lead to cytokine production. Um, I usually think of NLRs as frequently leading to NF-kappa B, but depending on the NLR, it can lead to different types of cytokines. But if you ask most immunologists, spoiler alert, or not, this isn't a spoiler, alert for stuff. Um, I worked in one of the labs that described NLRs as a postdoc, so I may be biased <laughs> in what I, some of my thoughts about NLRs. So NLRs can lead to transcription changes and cytokine production. But when most people think about NLRs, they think about their other function. At least when I think about NLRs, I think about their other function. And that function is why it's interesting to think about APAF1. So anybody remember APAF1 and where you might have learned about APAF1 in the past, in past classes? So you learned about APAF1 in Bio 250. APAF1 participates with, it binds to this protein called cytochrome C. It then binds to a thing called caspase 9. You guys are laughing. You're starting to remember this whole process. So tell me what you know about this whole, what I'm, this business that I'm talking about with APAF1 um, from what we're saying here. What's go, what do you know about APAF1? Yeah. It's, apoptosis. It, it's a part of the apoptosis cascade. It's involved in apoptosis. Anything else you remember kind of protein structure-wise or how proteins interact or anything like that. There's one thing that Dr. Dunaway loves to talk about here. Yeah. He talks about, he talks to talk about the wheel of death. <laughs> he talks about the pinwheel of death, right? That you have your cytochrome C's that bind to these proteins and it makes a big pinwheel. And that pinwheel turns on caspases and the caspases lead to apoptosis. Specifically, it's caspase three that eventually we turn on. Well, you know what? APAF1 uses its WD40 domain to bind cytochrome C, which is very similar to this domain that the NLRs have that they use to bind their ligands. That, the thing that Dr. Dunaway loves to talk about as the pinwheel of death, <laughs> its official name is the apoptosome because it's this protein complex involved in apoptosis. So it's the apoptosome. The other function of the NLRs is that they form this nice pinwheel structure <laughs> when binding to ligand. They, they don't work with uh, cytochrome C and caspase 3. They work with a protein called ASC, and they work with a protein called caspase 1. But it, looks, it becomes a pinwheel, just like the apoptosis pinwheel that you guys are used to. And we don't call this the apoptosome. Instead, this is going to lead to an inflammatory response. And so we call it the inflammasome. And so NLRs also lead to the inflammasome um, and inflammasome activity. You can think about an inflammasome as being a fancy way to turn on caspase 1. Just like you can think about the apoptosome as a fancy way to turn on caspase 3. When you think about caspases, what do you know about caspases or what are caspases? What's a caspase? Okay, what's the thing that has ace at the end of its name? Enzyme. So caspases are enzymes because they have ACE at the end of their name. They specifically actually um, cleave. They cleave um, on a specific part of an aspartic acid, which is where CASP comes from. But the point is that they are enzymes. They're specifically proteases that cleave other proteins. You guys have seen them previously 
in cleaving proteins that lead to apoptosis. But all caspases do not lead to apoptosis. There are apoptotic caspases and there are other types of caspases. Caspase 1 is a protease. It cleaves stuff, but it doesn't cleave apoptosis stuff. It cleaves other kinds of stuff. One of the things it cleaves, or two of the things it cleaves, are called pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18. It turns out that these two cytokines are made as proteins that are inactive that have to be cut before they're active. So caspase 1, when it's activated as part of an inflammasome, I don't know why your textbook doesn't draw a nice pinwheel. Pinwheels are much nicer. We make caspase 1 with this inflammasome. We can actually make the active form of these cytokines and release them. And IL-1 beta was the first one that was described for here. Um, and it is the, one of the cytokines in that bacterial inflammatory response you saw last time. So if you want to have good caspase 1, it has to be cleaved. So you've got to have an inflammasome. Um, the other thing that we've learned that caspase 1 can cleave is this protein called gazdermin. Gazdermin is actually pretty new. There were a couple cool, super cool gazdermin papers that came out this summer. Um, and gazdermin leads to another type of um, response that is really important when thinking about the inflammasome. And so again, we have to go back a little bit to Bio 250 to make some sense of this. So in Bio 250, you learned about cell death, apoptosis. You learned about programmed cell death, apoptosis, versus necrosis. And this shows you programmed cell death or apoptosis on the left and necrosis on the right. What you see is, in that program cell, is that this programmed cell death, it's called programmed because there are enzymes. There's a signaling process that makes it happen. Whereas necrosis, you almost think about as being like the mistake. It's not really a mistake necessarily, but it's just sort of the cell just dies. Notice that things happen in apoptosis, like the nucleus fragments. The cell shrinks. You get these nice membrane blebs. Whereas in necrosis, you get explosion of the cell. Apoptosis is not the only form of programmed cell death. It's the most famous. It's the first one that was described. But there are other ways that cells can die with some signaling involved um, that uh, we can think about as programmed cell death. So apoptosis is really one form of programmed cell death. You saw another one last time, actually, when we talked about netosis. But the one that I want to mention today is yet another form. Apoptosis is shown again here on the right. So let's think back to the antiviral state and interferons for a second. If I'm an infected cell, I'm in bad shape. So what do I do with this antiviral state business? I'm a sad infected cell. What am I going to do? What am I going to do, Jordan? Cells. Yeah, I'm going to say, hello, other cells. Please do not have my same fate. Please watch out for being like this. I'm going to warn my neighbors, right? When I think about apoptosis, I think about apoptosis as being quiet cell death. The cell is shrinking. It's condensing its nucleus. It's putting all of its little components into packets that it can send out. Apoptosis is sort of cell death where you're like, hi, I don't want to disturb anyone. I'm just going to die right here. That's apoptosis. But there's this other form of programmed cell death that I think of as loud cell death. It's cell death where you were telling your neighbors, oh my gosh, something bad is happening. I'm dying. Prepare yourself kind of cell death. And it's also a type of programmed cell death. This cell death is known as pyroptosis. And you can see pyroptosis listed here. So the prefix is pyro. If you think about a person who is a pyro, or you think about a funeral pyre, or any of the times where you use pyro, pyro what does pyro mean? Fire. Pyroptosis is officially fiery cell death. That's how it got the name. And so with pyroptosis, you see membrane swelling. You see membrane rupture. You see release of all intracellular contents. It's explosion. It's actually programmed necrosis. 
it's the cell purposefully <laughs> releasing its contents to potentially warn other cells and start an innate immune response in those other cells. Um, and when, sometimes when people think about damps, this might be a place where damps could come from. A cell dies, it releases stuff to its neighbors. Um, Gasdermin, we have recently found, is a protease that leads to pyroptosis. So caspase 1 turns on pyroptosis um, by turning on this new protein that's recently been described called Gasdermin. Um, and so that is the second function of the inflammasome. Yeah, Malik? The caspase 1, it turns on by cleaving it. Yes, absolutely. Great question. Um, and so, in fact, many of our PRRs can lead to changes in transcription and cytokine production, as well as caspase 1 activity that will eventually lead to cell death, pyroptosis, explosion loud, fiery, yelling to your neighbors, telling everyone there's bad things going on, cell death. Um, that can happen here. Um, just so you are aware, um, I didn't focus a lot on the um, PAMPs that bind to NLRs. So I told you that RLRs mostly bind to viral RNA. I told you that CLRs binding to fungal lectins told you that TLRs are either binding to bacterial product or viral RNA or viral DNA. Like I, I was really specific. I haven't been very specific with you with NLRs. Um, and the answer is we keep describing new NLRs and they keep binding to new stuff. And there's one of them in particular called NLRP3 that does not make any sense. So this is a, a short list of some of the things, things NLRP3 has been shown to uh, work downstream of. Um, you can see that some of them are things like ATP, cholesterol, uric acid, glucose, amyloid beta, and hyaluron, which are all self things. Um, so you could, those might be damps. We've got things like alum, asbestos, silica, alloy, UV radiation. Um, we've got bacterial pore forming toxins, flagellin, peptidoglycan, RNA, DNA, uh, beta glucan, mannose, zymosan, hyphae, and hemozoan. Um, Dr. Cassano would be, was here right now. He would not be happy. Because what he would be able to tell you is that, no, there is not one protein that binds to all of these things. Clearly, there's more going on that we don't understand. But it looks like many, 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 many types of things can turn on NLRs. And in fact, this may be why cell damage leads to inflammation. This may be how we link a lot of different clinical conditions to inflammation, because so many of them seem to be hitting a number of different NLRs. Um, and just to show that to you in a different way, um, these are a number of different types of, of diseases. Um, and here you can see whether or not we have looked in people um, to see are there people with this disease who have a mutation in some inflammasome component? And you can see that, yes, inflammatory bowel disease, yes, hypertension, yes, dermatitis, yes, all of these auto-inflammatory diseases, yes, type 1 diabetes, yes, vitiligo, yes, Addison's, yes, celiac, yes, rheumatoid. Um, if we, we have a drug that allows us to block IL-1, does this condition respond to IL-1? That might be another way you know that the inflammasome is important. All the ones we've tested, except for one, yes. <laughs> Can you use an animal um, that has uh, mutations in the inflammasome and get this disease? In many of these cases, yes. And so the inflammasome seems to be linked in to a lot of human conditions. Basically, when you look at it, you, f you seem to find more and more links all the time. Um, and there's a lot that we still have to figure out about that. So like, to give you an example, when I was in my postdoc, we had mice that were missing caspase 1. We had caspase 1 deficient mice that we worked with. And we could see they didn't make IL-1 beta and they didn't make all sorts of immune responses. They were also so fat that you couldn't wrap your hand around them. So there's clearly some you know, metabolism effects. There's a lot going on through some of these proteins um, that we are still trying to work out. Um, the final group of PRRs are near and dear to my heart um, and are listed here as the ALRs. These are in the cytosol and in some cases even in the nucleus. Some viruses need to use things like our DNA polymerase 
and other enzymes that are nuclear and access the nucleus. And so we even have to have PRRs in the nucleus that used to be exceptionally controversial. Um, these are largely binding to DNA forms of different microbes um, and leading to interferon production. They were so named because they were like a molecule called AIM2. So they were AIM2-like receptors. Um, some people also refer to them, uh, so they're ALRs or AIM2-like receptors because AIM2 was the first member of this family described. Um, some people also talk about them as being called the HIN200 family. It's because they all have this domain called the HIN200 domain. Some of them call them, the, some people call them the PIHIN family because they have a pyrin domain and a HIN domain. In humans, there's only four. Um, the HIN domain is really important for DNA binding. The pyrin is involved for protein-protein interactions. It's actually found in some of the NLRs too. It's the P for NLRPs. <laughs> um, these proteins are able to bind to DNA and interact with other receptors. One thing that's really interesting about them, one reason why my lab studies them, because I really think they're cool, is they have the ability to turn on IRFs and this cytokine production, and they have the ability to turn on caspase-1 and an inflammasome. So they can actually do the, some of the NLR's jobs and some of the TLR's jobs <laughs> all in one protein. And so you could imagine how targeting them, how a virus targeting them could like really mess your immune system up or how evolution there or how you know, hitting them could really influence your immune system pretty strongly, which is why I think they're so interesting. Um, so we can get pyroptosis, we can get interferons, both through these proteins, whereas in most of the other cases we're seeing one versus the other. Um, your textbook does something super interesting here when it talks about the ALRs. So the ALRs are these AIM-like receptors. They bind to nucleic acid. They've been shown to bind to nucleic acid very nicely. Um, and lead to interferon production. One thing that you can notice is that when they lead to an interferon production, they have a signaling intermediate known as sting. And in the literature, there's a little controversy with sting. Some people think sting plays with the ALRs. Other people say that sting plays with a different PRR family. Your textbook doesn't really mention a whole lot about the ALRs, but it puts the other family in. Like, it just assumes this thing works with them. Um, if you would like to know more information about that, there is an excellent paper published in 2018 um, by members of this class um, from the Barker Lab <laughs> trying to show that those pathways have worked together. But your textbook just kind of assumes it. So that's cool. Um, so we do also have um, another important DNA binding PRR called CGAS. Um, C-gas is an enzyme that makes a molecule called cyclic GMP AMP. So C-gas is cyclic, cyclic GMP AMP, AMP synthase. I do know how to talk, I promise. <laughs> um, it again leads to sting signaling, and the end result is IRFs and interferon production. And so again, we're seeing a DNA sensor. It's in the cytoplasm. It's binding to viral nucleic acid products. And it's leading, happily, to the antiviral response with IRF and interferon, as opposed to leading to an antibacterial response. All of these things that we've been talking about end of last week, throughout this week, have been major parts of the innate immune system. But of course, the innate immune system is not the whole immune system, and there are additional things as well. And so um, on Friday, we're going to start start our lengthy discussion of adaptive immunity um, with thinking about antibodies um, and the first part of adaptive immunity. Um, so that's what happens if all of these mechanisms we've been talking about don't work out. Happily, we still have adaptive left. I'll see you in lab tomorrow. Stuff is posted. Remember your assignment. <laughs>